Welcome to Hope on Fire, talk radio for life. And now today's host, Chris Lang. According to recent studies, there are now more churches closing than new churches opening. And only 25% of Americans now are practicing Christians. Given these trends, the church as we've known it in Western society may be on the way out. Could anything good be coming for the church? Hi, I'm Chris Lang, and I'm your host today on Hope on Fire. Today is part one of our series titled The Future of Church. My guest is Milton Adams, the founder of simplechurchathome.com, the most visited website regarding house churches in the world. Now let's join my interview with Milton. Thank you so much for joining me on Hope on Fire today. It's been over 10 years, I think, since we had our first interview in the old version of Hope on Fire. I, even as of recently as last year, got an email from somebody who was listening to a Christian radio station in our local area and said, I just heard an interview with you and Chris Lang. But it sounds like it was several years ago, so they're still <laughs> using that interview even today. Yes. In fact, this interview will be going out on Life Talk Radio Network, uh, all, the same network that your friend heard that old interview on uh, from 2000, 2010, I think we recorded that. Yeah. So this was soon after you started Simple Church, correct? Then when we, we had that first in interview, very early stages of it, we knew nothing about it. We just had a dream. We had a sense that God was leading this way, and we can talk in more detail about that. But yeah, that was in the early oh nine oh eight mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. period. So let's just jump into this, Milton. Um, what are house for those who are watching today who haven't seen the interview that? Milton and I are talking about, you can go to hopeonfire.tv and scroll through season three um, in on our website there, hopeonfire.tv, and you can scroll through and you can find, um, I believe it's called um, uh, Small Groups, part one. It was, it, was a, it was a series, two-part series we did, Milton, and I believe it was called Something about small groups, part one. So if you're watching today and you don't know about this interview, you can find it there. So Milton, you've been doing this for 15 years now, and you recently wrote an article that came out in, um, in a periodical, uh, which, which kind of summarized, uh, and we're going to unpack a lot of the research and sharing that you did in this article but for those who are watching, who don't know uh, what it is that you do, why don't you describe what is how, what are house churches and how did you get into developing them? Fifteen years ago, I transitioned from conventional pastoring. And that transition took place. It was driven by three main, three main things. The first was I was actually in some doctoral research and discovered a trend that was coming from Western Europe. And uh, that trend, I estimated, was going to land on North American shores about the year 2020. Now, this is not a prediction. This was just my best research uh, perspective on it. So given that trend, and we can touch base into that a little, a little later, but with that trend that was coming, I realized there was going to be a massive shift taking place on the church landscape across North America. Now, to complicate that whole thing, as part of my research, I was looking at a bunch of research regarding um, youth and young adults. And uh, there was one that was quite impactful for me, which came out of the value genesis studies that were done at Andrews University. At that time, my oldest boy was 10 years old. Now, remember, I was a pastor of a conventional church, and my oldest boy comes up to me one morning when we're getting ready to go to church, and he says, Daddy, do I have to go to church anymore? 
And I took it as a 10-year-old, like in response to a 10-year-old, but for me, the, the light bulb started going off because I realized if the research was accurate, these were the early signs of my own children beginning to disconnect from church as we know it, the church that I was pastoring, and that in many cases leads on to disconnecting from God. And so my wife and I um, left some major, not left, we shifted from a profession of pastoring into online education, which allowed me then to make some changes in our family. And one of those goals was to actually reach and save our own children. Mm. Well, those were some of the behind the scenes, a bit of the backstory that drove me, the, the trend coming from Western Europe, the real experience of my own children with my 10-year-old asking me that pivotal question, and then the data of the value genesis studies, um, all of that kind of came together and said, we need to make do some things differently. So this was before you got permission from the Seventh-day Adventist Church to actually start developing what is essentially a a house church from the Book of Acts, correct? Yes. um, There's a very interesting dynamic, and that is in decentralized systems, whether you're talking house churches, whether you're talking homeschoolers, Homes, for example, homeschooling moms do not call up a local school principal and say, may I homeschool my kids? <laughs> um, Uber did not call up the taxi companies and say, may we start Uber? Airbnb didn't call up. Cryptocurrencies didn't call up. And the list just goes on and on. And so part of the DNA of house churches that meet in homes in real person, real life experiences, is they are people who are committed to follow the the mission of God and the gospel commission of Christ more than they are committed to what often is seen as um, church traditions. Now, that's okay. not a critique against church tradition. I'm not. We're not. I'm not doing that. But it's just people are saying. We are, we are skeptical, but let me just say, Chris, right up front here, as we, as we dive into this, this is not a critique on any denomination. It's not a criticism of church leadership, of the pastoral staff, of um, children's programming leaders. It's not a critique of them. It is wrestling with the dynamics of a culture that is drastically changing. And so um, as we go through and unpack some of the implications of culture and what's happening, um, everyone longs for a a, a thriving Christian, um, God-focused experience Mm -hmm. that is based in Scripture but it has realness to it. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the drive behind house churches. Instead of just listening to presentations, there are people who are wanting to truly engage and dialogue about Scripture and be held accountable to Scripture, even though when it's tough. Mm. So why don't you just, this isn't on on my notes, but it just occurs to me, why don't you differentiate between a small group then that that meets once a week or once a month from a house church? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, small groups over the years have taken many uh, forms and many, uh, they've been titled and uh, called many things, everything from um, way back in the day, uh, we're talking about early Christendom. There were the Methodists had social meetings. Um, those often then there was um, prayer meetings. There were small groups. If you track that on down through history, um, there were different things called um, grow, uh, growth groups. 
There were G3s, G12s, LTG groups. Um, so there was a whole different, um, but the common denominator among all these is they typically met during the week and the goal was to build relationships and then invite these people to the conventional church paradigm, more of a brick and mortar paradigm. Mm. Nothing wrong with that. It has worked well for, for decades. But in a culture that is becoming more and more skeptical of organized, top-down based systems, religious or secular, um, it's becoming an issue of trust. And our culture is moving away from trusting the government, trusting the medical systems, trusting the church systems. Uh, again, so this is not a critique. This is a cultural shift that's taking place. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. house churches um, naturally can fit into that decentralization process where people it's you don't have leaders that are kind of set above everybody else, but mm -hmm. everyone's at, on the same playing field, which is a principle of scripture that at the foot of the cross, we are all equal. So the house churches focus much more in on incorporating and uh, incorporating what we see in scripture into the essence of a gathering instead of it being a stepping stone to a conventional church system. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned in your article, Milton, that these changes have happened much more rapidly than you expected from the data that you saw in 2007. Why don't you talk about some of these major trends that you've said have been happening faster than expected in the traditional Western church. Uh, so just to step back a bit, it was back in 20, uh, 2007, 2008, when I began to realize that in Western Europe, there had been a major exodus from conventional churches. Um, before the era, before the COVID era, I actually was in Europe on bet between two to four weeks on a given year working with church leaders um, because across Western Europe, on average, um, three to five percent of the population was going to church. And typically that's defined by once a month. And as I looked at the previous years leading up to that, in the in the 2007, 8, 9, 10 uh, time period, this was a trend that was going to shift to the United States. Um, no one knew what the timeline was, but in general, it takes between 10 and 15 years for trends to migrate to the United States, and then another 10 plus or minus years for them to migrate onto the global south. That is why I was guessing approximately 2020-ish is when we would see the effects of these. But uh, what happened is in 2019, um, the data started getting published for the very first time in the history of the United States. We are now closing more churches than we are opening. Now that's a tipping point. That is pre-COVID um, data because once COVID hits, it only escalates after that and... Um, the ongoing data into the future of, of the, what's going to happen with church is probably not going to be a return to what we saw in previous decades. Similarly, because in Western Europe, although they have tried all kinds of things, there has not been a resurgence back to the conventional churches. So let's talk about COVID for a second and how that accelerated overnight, this dynamic. <sighs> So uh, when the government comes in and, and begins shutting things down, um, which happened all across North America, all around the world, it threw denominations a bit into a crisis because denominations have a very clear under uh, clear um, calc uh, they have a very clear um, perception on they need the financial funding which is collected each Sabbath. So they 
needed to find ways to not only keep their audience engaged, but keep the revenue stream flowing. And some denominations did very well and others had more difficulties. So COVID resets, COVID resets the, the norms and creates an acceptable, um, it creates an acceptable uh, norm in Christianity that I can just stay at home and, and zoom into church. And so that is what was created in COVID. And then, of course, once churches are reopened, people have now been trained and all the technology has been has been boosted in the local churches so that the live streaming can continue to go on. And people are legitimately saying, why do I need to go there when I can just zoom in? And it actually makes... And we can touch in on this, on this a little later. It, nat- it naturally set the stage for consumerism to blossom because I don't have to physically go to another church if there's a, a new speaker or something. I can just Zoom hop all across the country, all around the world, and that has become the new norm. Didn't it seem um, almost prophetic that your son, your 10-year-old, was saying the same thing that happened very dynamically globally, especially in the United States, 10 it years was. later. It was. It was ten year, about 10 years earlier, right, yeah. than the COVID, where he says, do I need to go to church anymore? And, and he didn't hear that from mom and dad. He's picking that up in a subculture of church where it's a case of... Uh, well, I can take it or leave it. If it's if I, if I like it, if it's good enough, in, in his case, it would have been more the kids programming. Do I like the teacher or don't I like the teacher? And it has created a dynamic uh, that is very me focused. Do I like it? Do I like the programming? Do I like the music? And Chris, this 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 undercurrent of consumerism transcends liberal or conservative labeling. Because on one hand, in the past, people that were conscientious Christians wanted to, in many ways, move to a more conservative style of worship. Now, that's not to say that liberal are not conscientious. But for the sake of understanding the dynamics they would move to a more conservative environment. But the reason they move to a conservative uh, worship environment versus a liberal is still based on the same foundational question of, do I like it? And that foundational question, our children pick that up. They pick that up, whether it's the Sunday school or the Sabbath school. It's the same foundation where then... Um, teachers who have dedicated their time to help children. Now, let me back up. 50 years ago, it was very different. We weren't in as much as a consumer-driven culture as we are today. But the, the landscape of culture and the landscape of church culture has drastically changed. And church has become very consumeristic. And so how do we raise children not to be consumers, Yet the whole culture and the church environment and what attracts people to church is based on consumerism. It's a bit of an oxymoron that is actually difficult to overcome just by saying we are to be servants when Mm -hmm. the culture doesn't support that. So after you share how the traditional church started, Milton, the history for many that don't know, including me, when I saw your article, that was very instructive to me. But then I want you to talk about the, the Jewish synagogues that were the churches in the book of Acts and how the synagogues were different from what Constantine did. So let's talk about Constantine first. Okay. This is, this is this, a sensitive part of the discussion, Chris, and I want to recognize that up front because what I'm going to share um, for many uh, good-hearted, committed Christians Um, what Constantine did has been kind of buried under years and centuries of um, in the history books. And it's not talked about a lot, but it was pivotal 
in shifting what we see in the New Testament church, shifting it into what we see as modern church today. And Constantine played a crucial role in that. So let me outline it. There are, there are four big changes that he made, but for the sake of of um, this time together, I'm only going to highlight three. So let me give you the quick outline. Constantine changed the location. He changed, let me reverse that. Constantine changed the leadership. He changed the location and he changed lordship. So let's first talk about the leadership. In the New Testament, there is a strong teaching that of the priesthood of all believers. If you are a Christian, if you claim the name of Christ, we are collectively the priesthood of all believers. Constantine, with leadership, he did away with the concept of the priesthood of all believers, and he established a caste of priests that um, or is where Protestantism gets the pastor concept from. It harks back to Constantine. Then he changes the location and moves it from home churches, which is what the New Testament was. It was a massive New Testament house church system. And he moves it to a different location, which were the basilicas, Now, the reason he moves it to the basilicas is because Constantine becomes a Christian and he is shifting everyone into the church as we know it. So he changes the leadership from the priesthood of all believers that takes place in house churches and puts in place a caste of priests or what we call pastors. He does away, he closes down the house churches, moves them into basilicas, And the third thing is the part that a lot of people are not aware of. And this is probably the more of the sensitive items, but he changes lordship. He changes Sabbath, which harks clear back to the the creation where, where God put in place two basic organizations or institutions, if you want to call it marriage between a male and a female and the seventh-day Sabbath. Those were established before sin, before the Jewish nation. They go clear back to the creation week. And Constantine changes the lordship, where Scripture says, where Jesus is speaking, says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Constantine changes that and says, we're going to move the day of worship to Sunday. Now, this was an ingenious act politically for Constantine. So let me now describe it from the perspective of a a priest in a culture where I was a pagan priest. Constantine becomes a Christian. Now, if I want to keep my job politically, I need to become a Christian priest. Right. So what I do is I... By the way, hold that thought, Milton. For those who don't know about Constantine, he was around 300 AD, 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea, discussing the the books of the Bible and all of that. But Constantine had instituted all these changes around 300 AD, just for people that don't know the history. So for the first three centuries of church history, it was by and large house church based. Um. How did it transition from the book of Acts, meeting in synagogues, or was it happening, you know, because synagogue could, because the, the founders of the Christian religion were Jews, and this is often forgotten and pushed aside. Jesus in Matthew 24 said, pray, last day events, last day predictions, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath or in the winter or in the winter. So he prophesied that the last day people living for him on the earth would be keeping the seventh day Sabbath at the very end of time. And so, so, so again, 
what you've just summarized, this transition with Constantine three centuries later, these were Sabbath, Seventh-day Sabbath keepers that were founders of the Jewish, of, of the Christian church. And of course, Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. So the synagogues that they worshiped in on the Sabbath, and they brought Gentiles in to celebrate Sabbath. They were discipling the Gentiles of the areas where the Jews had synagogues. How do you see that comparison? And we'll get back to the pagan priesthood and the transition. But I just wanted to touch on these Jewish synagogues and the house church in the book of Acts. That is really good. We actually need to take it one step back to the temple. Okay. Because the temple, how many temples were there? One. There's one temple. Yeah. And so with that one temple, it if, if Christianity, after Christ sends out his gospel commission, it's impossible for everyone to meet in the temple. It right. just becomes logistically impossible. Um, as, the, as the rise of, of Jewish and the synagogues are built, I have been told by those that have studied this way more that there actually are certain requirements for when a synagogue can be built in terms of the brick and mortar structure of the synagogue. But there were a number of other things going on as well, um, where as the synagogue and the and the, those that are that are leading all of all the surrounds that are becoming in many cases narrower and narrower and narrower and instituting more and more laws in essence to protect God's moral law. And you combine that with the, with Paul, Paul, what's his background? His background is he's a Pharisee. He's trained by the Pharisees of all Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And yet when Paul gets ready to see the birthing of a movement called Christianity, he doesn't go around building buildings. Mm. For some reason, he realizes that this has got to go at a grassroots organic level mm. for it to sweep the empire like, we, like it did. And it did. It swept all across the empire, which is where many of our New Testament books come from as Paul and others are writing back to these churches that are meeting in homes. In many cases, it's encouraging them, but some cases it's, it's admonishing them and calls them on the carpet on, on things. How dare you carry the name of Christ in and uh, continue in some of these ways. Acts chapter 13 is a big shift in the early, you're talking about the Apostle Paul. And here in Acts chapter 13, it just came, the Holy Spirit brought it to my mind just now. There's much more to come in our overtime segment. To watch the full episode, visit hopeonfire.tv and look for episode 61, The Future of Church, part one. And please subscribe to our Livestreams Media YouTube channel. I'm Chris Lang. Thanks for joining us. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a nonprofit film production ministry. To access this program or to make a donation, please visit hopeonfire.tv. See you next time, and may God set your hope on fire. Welcome back to our program. I'm Chris Lang, your host on Hope on Fire. Today, we're talking with my guest, Milton Adams, the founder of simplechurchathome.com, the most visited website regarding house churches in the world. Now, let's get back to my interview with Milton. Paul had been preaching on Sabbath. The Jewish brethren had asked him if he had a word to speak. And there are 32 verses in his sermon. And just shortly after that sermon is preached, they go out, and the scripture says in the King James Version and New King James, that the Jews and the Gentiles were asking them questions as they came out. And then the Gentiles begged him to come next Sabbath to teach them the same 
stuff. And what was his sermon about? His sermon was about who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. And we see later in that same chapter, this big pivot you're talking about that Paul recognizes, and it says right there after that sermon that the Gentiles were begging him to come and preach to them that same message about Jesus the next Sabbath. Then the, the very next Sabbath, the scripture says in that chapter that almost the whole city showed up. Yes. And, and the Jews were jealous. Sounds like an institutional problem, doesn't it? It says the Jews were jealous and they blasphemed the words that Paul was preaching. We know from John chapter 10 and other places what the definition biblically of blasphemy is. But the Lord showed me when I memorized this chapter, Milton, that the opposite, right? We know from the Bible that blasphemy is a man claiming to be God. That's, the, that's what we understand the traditional uh, biblical definition. But flipping that around, what was Paul's message? If the Jews were blaspheming Paul's messages, we know what his sermon was about. Jesus is God who became a man. So they were saying literally, blaspheming, Jesus is not God. To say that God is not God is also blasphemy. To say that Jesus, to say that God did not become a man is blasphemy. That was fascinating when the Lord showed me that. So the Jews were trying to preserve an institution. And the very next thing that we see in that chapter, Milton, is Paul says, the Holy Spirit told us to reject the Jews because you have rejected God. You have rejected Jesus Christ. And now we're taking our message to the Gentiles. That whole pivot happened. And this is a huge pivot, pivot but I, I want to be, I want us to make sure that we're not saying, okay, modern day church institutions have rejected God. And I'm, I don't think you're saying that either. No. But, no. but it is true that the Jewish nation had rejected God. They had rejected the Messiah. What we're seeing in modern day paganism today, the return of paganism in our culture, they're saying the same thing about Jesus Christ in our movie Mystified. We, we talk about this, and it was memorizing Acts 13 where the Lord showed me what is happening today with this, this new age idea that Jesus is not God. And even church leaders today who claim to be Christian are teaching the world that Jesus is is just a man, and that Christ is not a person. Christ is a collective, uh, yeah. a spirit that manifests in all the universe. Yeah. So this is very much pagan, and they have to twist the scriptures to say something that it doesn't say. Yeah. So, we're, so, so I share in part for that understanding, but, but getting to... The idea that Paul did preach in synagogues, but it was for a purpose, for a limited time. And then the house church became dominant after, after he, he left the Jewish synagogue because they were rejecting the message, right? And Paul was following the council in Luke 10, where Jesus says, go to the lost go reach them, and we have the whole concentric circle, start local and then move out. And Paul was following that. He wasn't going to the Jewish just to give them a good sermon on Sabbath to the, to the to synagogues. He wasn't going because he was the circuit righty preacher and it would draw a big crowd. He was going there with a very clear message that Jesus was the Messiah and he was calling upon their hearts to do that. And on his third missionary journey, when he gets kicked out of the synagogue for the last time, he goes next door to a home. Hmm. Hmm. And we see the over the transition of his three missionary journeys, by the time he gets to that third missionary journey, he has set his sights on a house church network. 
Now, he may not have called it that, right. but he goes out and begins establishing house churches all across the empire. And that is where we see Christianity just explode. Milton, this is fascinating. You have just wonderfully tied into Acts chapter 1, where Jesus commanded the apostles to start local, and then to Samaria, and then to the whole world. That's a fascinating application to the trajectory Paul was on, to keep the message at home at first, keep it with the Jews at first. And so he was doing the best he could. And that's why he ran into such opposition is because it was becoming clearer and clearer that as a Jewish people, and I'm not trying to uh, put down or criticize Jews or my fellow Jewish brothers and sisters who have embraced Christ. I'm just saying historically, Paul was at his heart, he was a missionary and he was going in to share the Messiah and right. it was not well received. So let's now leap forward. Now that we've talked, I'm so thankful we had this discussion about synagogues and house churches in the book of Acts. This has been really uh, <clears throat> inspiring to me. Now let's leap back forward to Constantine and the pagan priesthood and how that then captured the dynamic in the shift in Christianity. Um, and as we jump back to that shift, we probably ought to just quickly note that as in the Roman Empire, there's an anti-Jewish sentiment that is swelling. Um, and as part of that, because the Jews are uh, worshiping on Sabbath, Christians want to, in various ways, distance themselves from mm -hmm. that. Part of that, which did not happen overnight, it happened over years but it really culminates in the 320s um, A.D., and Constantine is politically um, is a political genius when it comes to this. So he is he is uh, putting his government stamp of approval on Christianity, which is both a blessing and a curse. Mm. In many ways, now it's accepted. And uh, we've already talked about how in this process, he changes the leadership, the location, and the lordship. And with the leadership, we've already talked about that. He moves away from the priesthood of all believers, where in house churches, the priesthood work together. And in establishing a professional cast of leader, it doesn't matter what background you came from, you were automatically... Um, elevated above the laity. That was very intentional. While I'm here, let me just add this footnote. When Constantine did this, he gave the priests, which used to be now, they used to be pagan priests, they're now Christian priests, he gave them a job description that highlights several things. I'm just going to highlight four. It was only the priests that could marry people, bury people, distribute communion or the Eucharist. And it was only the priests who could baptize. Only they could do, this was what happened in, in house churches, because at the heart of the gospel commission, when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and then the promise that he is with us till the very end. Constantine is actually reversing the gospel commission when he says, no, this is the, the, the ability to baptize is exclusively the responsibilities of the priests. So he changes um, the leadership. He changes the location from home churches to now basilicas, and he changes lordship, moving it from Sunday, uh, from the seventh day Sabbath to Sunday. So if I'm a priest in the empire, if I'm a pagan priest and Constantine has become a Christian, if I'm going to keep my job, I've got to become a Christian priest. So I do. Now my job is secure and life is good. Here's why. 
I don't have the competitions of house of, of house churches anymore because Constantine has closed them all down and said you must move into the basilicas. I no longer have the competition of the priesthood of all believers because that has been delegated exclusively to me. And since we now meet in my basilica, which used to be a pagan basilica, now that it's a Christian basilica, we meet in the Christian basilica. It's standing room only. I am the central figure. I'm the gatekeeper. I can only marry, bury, baptize, and distribute the Eucharist. Life is good for me as now a Christian priest, and everyone is used to it because we're meeting on Sunday, which was in honor of the sun god in paganism. But now in Christianity, it is moved to Sunday in honor of Christ's resurrection, although that command is never given in Scripture. Right, right. So the the pushback in the traditional church, um, you were just talking earlier about the acceleration of the change of church-going people and the distrust post-COVID of governments and authorities. And this is, this is all kind of snowballed into an acceleration of the exits from traditional church. It's a huge change. And the need, it, but it doesn't mean that people have stopped searching for spirituality. And that kind of leads me to the next part of our discussion, Milton. Today, many unchurched Christians are looking for a direct experience of God. This is the very definition of mysticism. And mysticism, for those of you who haven't seen our recent film, Mystified, The Rise of Mysticism and the Antichrist, mysticism means the very definition, it's it's practices that lead a person to an altered state of consciousness. And this is accomplished through a variety of practices. It can include an Eastern form of meditation, not the biblical definition. Psychedelic drugs are becoming mainstream. The U.S. government is funding research with magic mushrooms and other drugs. We also can find uh, cultures and traditions that use music and chanting and dancing, like the Sufi Muslims in Africa. And so this ultimately leads to a new age concept of Jesus and the Bible, where, where Jesus is just a man, where, where the Bible is just a collection of stories that are not, to, not presenting absolute truth from the God of heaven, but simply ideas and good lessons that we can apply, but n- nothing that we should take as absolute truth. And then, of course, there's no personal devil, Milton, that, that this whole idea that eventually becomes the, the variation between light and dark, the good vibrations versus the bad vibrations. This is the coexisting of evil and good eternally, which was part of the original lie in Eden. It wasn't just you will not surely die. It was Satan telling Eve that your eyes will be opened. You're going to be enlightened. You're going to now see like God sees. And that means that you're going to see that evil, good and evil, coexist. So this is the concept in Buddhism of non-duality, which is what these leaders in so-called Christianity now are using similar terms, that the whole universe is one, Milton, that you are one with God and you are not separate from anything. This is, this is the definition actually of what shamans believe and witches believe. Mm-hmm. So, so we are increasingly in a pagan culture, Milton, even here in the United States. And I want you to talk about the promise of house churches going back to the book of Acts and your experience in reaching an increasingly pagan culture. I think the, some of the best is yet to come. And why do I say that? Because Paul was working in a predominantly pagan culture. And we see in that culture, not in an institutionalized top-down approach, but in a grassroots that re-empowers 
the laity to do all the work of discipleship that Jesus gave them in the Gospel Commission, in that, in that, based on that foundation, we see Christianity go like wildfire across the Roman Empire. So I am wondering, I don't know, but I'm wondering if God is setting the stage for mm. a similar repeat of history, of course, with with some different some different, some different, um, uh, um, some different um, experiences along the way, but in general, a, a repeat. So maybe I'd uh, introduce a gentleman by the name of, of George Barna. Now, some people like George Barna, some people don't. Before he was a before he was a Christian, he and I'm gonna I'm gonna truncate this way down. But before he was a Christian, he was a campaign politician uh, politician speechwriter. And so when he becomes a Christian, he starts born uh, Barna dot org, an organization which became known as the major um, authority on Christian trends in the United States. So what happens uh, regarding your specific question about spirituality? He just, just meaning last year, published some new findings that 74% of, of people today are interested in growing spiritually. Now, I need to define the word spiritually because whenever God has truth, Satan provides a counterfeit. And often the words overlap, which makes it harder to discern truth from air. So when we talk about spirituality, the spirituality that I'm going to talk about is a spirituality that is anchored in Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's anchored Mm -hmm. in Scripture. There is also a spirituality which you have alluded to out there in the with the pagan background and the pagan influences, which is a very convoluted, all-encompassing approach to kind of everything goes. So when Barna talks about that the culture, even though the culture is shifting to pagan in its, in its roots, secular, even though the culture is shifting that way, there is an inner longing. And when I say inner mm-hmm. longing, I'm wanting to use Ecclesiastes 3 verse what? 3 verse 11, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that God has put eternity in our hearts. This is something that the New Ages can't steal. This is something that God did when he created us in his image. Mm -hmm. So there is a longing that comes from our heart for an experience, an authentic experience, not a mushroom-induced experience or other styled experiences, but an authentic experience to have with our creator God because he put that in us. Mm-hmm. Now, it's it's too early to tell, I believe, whether this 74% of an American population that is interested in growing spiritually, what that actually means yet. But it does flow from what God put in their heart. Now, whether the they end up following the counterfeit version or the God version, um, that is yet to be determined, and of course, people have freedom of choice along the way. Milton, I think that everything you were just sharing is the reason why the message about who is Jesus is crucial. It, because if Jesus is God, yes. self-existent, eternal, that's why I believe, by the way, non-Trinitarian um, controversies are growing because they're also claiming Jesus is not self-existent, eternal God. Mm. They're putting him down on the level of a created being, but they will never say he was created. Mm. They will say he emanated from the Father. But, he's, but you see, these are semantics. These are, twi- these are just stretching words to try to, you, try to not be like the Mormons who say, Jesus and Lucifer were created beings. In fact, they were brothers. So getting back to who is Jesus is crucial. And I, and I really believe <clears throat> that God is setting the table in the world today so that the pure religion of Jesus, 
and the Holy Spirit that is promised to his believers that actually comes in to a human heart that is surrendering. What are they surrendering to? They're surrendering to the biblical truth that teaches us. Mm. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above how many things? All things. All things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? So it it says we're so bad, Milton, (laughs) that... We can't even know unless God himself reveals it to us. Yeah. And so this idea that there is no original sin, this idea that mankind is really a God, eventually they're going to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to them, right? Because all you have to do is look around and see the increasing suicide rates from these famous celebrities. And you... The Holy Spirit is tapping on people's door, their heart doors, and they're saying, how's that working out for you? How's that working out, my friend? Would you like to learn the truth about reality? There is a place outside of time and space, but only God lives there. They claim that when you go into an altered state that you transcend time and space, That you go into this realm where God lives. But no, this is demonic deception. And so I agree with you, Milton. I believe that all of this is leading up for a final confrontation so that God's people who worship him in spirit and truth, they will be able to speak a good word for him in a world that is increasingly chaotic Uh, you referenced um, the whole idea of how God is setting the table. I want to jump, if, if it's okay, Chris, kind of to the end of the story, and then we'll hop back to where we are. Okay. The end of the story describes who God's end time people are going to be. It doesn't name them via denomination. It doesn't name them with a bunch of characteristics, but a very few and very specific. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to turn our attention just briefly to the Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Because here, God describes his end time people of all nations, tribes, languages. And it's important to remember that the beginning of Revelation is tells us that this is the testimony of Jesus. That sets the stage for all of of Revelation. So when we get to Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 12, and for those um, who may not know exactly what that is, let me just give a quick little summary. Many around the world are familiar with uh, the gentleman Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. Billy Graham used to say, uh, when he was alive, that... Revelation 14 is God's last message to the entire world. And I think he was right. Other people have been saying that as well, but I think he, he's probably one of the more popular ones that said it. I think he's, he's spot on because it outlines three messages from three angels, but then in the 14 verse 12, God describes his end time people. This is, this is part of the punchline as far as, I see it. God says, here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what's fascinating to me, if you roll back just a couple chapters into Revelation uh, 12, 17, we have Satan identifying the people who he's going to target with his end time fury. And when you compare Revelation 14, 12 and Revelation 12, 17, you have the same description spot on. And what that tells me is God knows who his people are as described as those who keep the commandments of God. And Satan knows exactly who his enemies are, specifically those who keep the commandments of God. And so there is a people 
in this table that God may be setting here at the end of time in in a very secular, de-churched, mm-hmm. unchurched, non-churched, paganistic mm-hmm. culture, whatever you're going to call it. Mm-hmm. We know that in the hearts, uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put in our hearts a desire to turn towards him. Mm-hmm. We know that there are counterfeits on every, on our, every side. But we also know how we can spot the true. Because the people are those that have, keep the commands of God and have the faith of Jesus. By the way, the faith of Jesus is very, very significant. You know, it was only recently, Milton, that I came to understand what John the Apostle is saying. Faith of Jesus. Even our faith is a gift. Yes. But, it, but it comes through the indwelling Christ by His Holy Spirit. And so through the Holy Spirit, we actually receive gifts that when God dwells in us, the kingdom of God is in us, but Jesus Christ himself then imparts to us his faith and his disposition. So that's where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. The Father is seeking these kinds of worshipers. Yeah. Who are they? The, the ones you're talking about. They're not just commandment keepers keeping correct doctrine. Right. They have a disposition that reflects yeah. their creator. But they yeah. don't have it on their own. Exactly. Because everything comes from, from God and from the power of Christ living in us and through us. The ability... Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We don't keep the commandments to get saved. We keep the commandments because we are saved. Um, Parents parents get this real, real, real clearly. Johnny, go clean your room. The evidence of lordship is evidenced in Johnny's obedience. Mm. If mom and dad are, to use in this analogy, lord, parent, then that means... (laughs) <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> if Johnny, as we were saying, uh, acknowledges mom and dad as Lord in their life, then he obeys. And if he doesn't, parents know that they're not the boss. So it comes down to a lordship. And that was part of what Constantine was changing. He was changing the essence of lordship from a lordship that surrendered in obedience to Christ and what he asked to a lordship that was a counterfeit compromise that politically was ingenious, but it, it, has, it has kept itself embedded in the traditions of churches around the world for the past 2,000 years. I'm going to leap over a couple of these topics to, to what you were just describing. And that is, do the house leaders, the house church leaders, the lay people who you're training to develop these, these house-based churches, do they actually baptize the people who come and learn every Sabbath? And if they do, talk about how that relates to the dynamic of institutional preservation. Join us next time for more of my interview with Milton in part two of our series, The Future of Church. God bless you.